Good evening. Oh, y'all can do better than that. Good evening. And welcome to God Talk. We are extremely excited to be here. Thank you so much for being here this evening. For those of you who are here live, for those of you who are streaming with us, we welcome you to this conversation. And I am so excited to have each and every person uh, that is sitting here today in this place. I know this conversation is going to be robust, and I know uh, that we will walk away better for this conversation. So jumping right into it, I want to introduce our, our panelists for this evening, from starting here on my right and working its way down, Dr. Bashir Muhammad, who is the senior uh, researcher at the Pew Research Center. Beside him is Candice Bimbo, writer and theologian, uh, known for the 443 blog post and many other writings, including the Lemonade Syllabus, which followed the visual album by Beyonce. Beside Candace, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Tyree Boyd Patz, who is the history curator here at CAM, and also the curator of the House Sweet the Sound Gospel Music Exhibit, which we are partnering with this program with, uh, and the exhibit closes this weekend, and I commend this exhibit. Those of you who are uh, streaming with us, you may not be able to see it, but those of you who are here in person, we encourage you to see the exhibit uh, during our intermission time and before it closes this weekend. Beside Tyree is Dr. Ryan Cobb. He is the assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Arlington. And finally, Pastor Michael Fisher is a gospel recording artist under the name of Jay Kingdom, local radio host and pastor of the Greater Zion Church family here in Los Angeles, California. Let's welcome all of our panelists for this evening. So we have a group of talkers here tonight, so we're going to jump right into it, all right? So I really want to start the conversation. We, we broke the evening conversation up into two panels. One is faith in context, and the second panel is faith in community. Our first panel is really to ground the conversation in what's going on with black millennials. And so I really want to start the conversation with Dr. Muhammad, who is from the Pew Research Center, to really pose the first question to you. Um, but before we pose the question, I did want to go around with the panelists and allow them to self-identify. Again, this conversation is open, and we have people from a myriad of different faith traditions and backgrounds represented on the panel. So we wanted to make sure that that was also shown throughout the conversation. So I'm going to start at this end uh, with Pastor Fisher. If you would just briefly say your name and what faith tradition you come from. Oh, um, my name is Pastor Michael Fisher. I'm the senior pastor of Greater Zion Church Family in Compton, California. And, um, well, we have Baptist roots. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, so Baptist. Yeah. My name is Dr. Ryan Cobb. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work at the University of Texas at Arlington, and I am Progressive National Baptist. Um, my name is Tyree Boyd Pates, um, and I am someone who's actively decolonizing his faith while never forgetting the ancestors who I stand on the shoulders thereof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, y'all. I am Candace Benbo. I was born and raised missionary Baptist. Um, I am also a womanist who loves the spirit, so um, my faith roots are now uh, spread a little bit wider than uh, the Baptist tradition so that I can uh, fully affirm uh, all parts of me. I'm Bashir Mohammed. I'm a researcher at the Pew Research Center, as you heard, um, and I'm a Muslim. Awesome. So Bashir, if I could start the conversation with you, what is the current state of millennial participation in organized faith traditions, and what does it mean? Well, I think, um, to answer that, I think the, the basic point I would make is that millennial faith is representing a, a, a crossroad, representing uh, sort of two broad streams that we see in American religion overall. Um, first, black Americans tend to be more religious and more spiritual um, than Americans of other races. On the other hand, we see that millennials tend to be less religious and less spiritual than older adults. And so the, in the intersection of those, we see black millennials who are more religious than other millennials, but still less religious than older black Americans. Hmm. 
So in that, if we're talking about that, we're seeing a generation of black millennials um, being less religious as the previous generation, what are some of the factors, and I'll open this conversation up, what are some of the factors, um, and I definitely would want to hear your uh, opinion on this, Pastor Fisher, but what are some of the factors that contribute to blacks leaving organized religion? Bashir, was that anything that came up in the research that was done? Um, <clears throat> I think that we see uh, a, a number of factors to that. Uh, you're broadly speaking, uh, black millennials tell us that they have a sort of mixed views toward the church. On the one hand, they tell us that they do believe that the church does a good job. Many, many say that the church does a good job in creating community, does a good job in helping the poor. Um, on the other hand, they have real concerns about um, some of the church's uh, ish views on things like sexuality. For example, the majority of uh, millennials, black millennials, say that they believe that homosexuality should be accepted by society, whereas many um, churches, many historically black churches, are still very conservative on these issues. Um, I, I would think that from some of the millennials that I've talked to, um, the conflict is in practicality. Um, everything is too mystified, right? And so they're like, you know, I just Googled this answer. <laughs> I, I need you to be able to explain this too. And don't just give me, well, that's how we've always done it. So there seems to be no explanation happening in the church which is frustrating a lot of millennials because they come there looking for answers and they assume that the preacher or the pastor or the elder or the great potentate or the bishop or whatever the title is should be able to give them basic answers such as why do we put this doily on our head? You know, why do we all have to wear white? Uh, why do I have to put this band around my arm? And when they keep getting met with because that's how it's always been done, they're like, I'm out because we're not an ignorant generation. You know, give me specific answers and then I'll rock with you a little bit more. Mm. So that's something I've seen. Anyone else? I, I mean, I, I think personally as a millennial myself, I think this generation is probably one of the most information-based generations of all time. And we're constantly wanting to engage our parents and our foremothers and our forefathers about the faith that they pass on to us, but they don't have answers. And when I personally was asked to stop critically thinking about the ways my life and the intersections thereof interact with my faith, and I was told to pray about it, I was dissatisfied. And I know many of millennials, particularly those in this room, are dissatisfied with that. And we can never shelve the critical mind that we've gotten through an education um, for the faith that we bend our knee on. Yeah, I, th I think when you, um, particularly looking at African-American women, young sisters, we watched our grandmothers, we watched our mothers um, work in churches um, tirelessly. And then we also watch them be mistreated in those same sanctuaries, right? And then we watch them go home and be mistreated by the men that were in their family, many of whom were deacons and trustees, hello. Um, and so we realized that there was this disconnect between what was being preached and what uh, was being lived in and, and, and pondered upon in the everyday lives of black women. And I think that when you are looking at a generation that was as equally formed by the church as we were by hip hop culture. Um, and having the access to education, having the access to what it means to be able to name our own kinds of traumas. Um, we are not gonna be sisters that just stand idly by in sanctuaries and suggest or believe that God sanctions our mistreatment, right? And so I think that when we, when we try to name uh, what's happening with black millennials, particularly young African-American sisters, the move away from the traditional church and re-embracing, fully embracing uh, indigenous African religions um, and alternative forms of spirituality because there's a wholeness there that we have to really think about the ways in which um, the church has done damage to us spiritually and emotionally, and those spaces help to remember us. So since we're here, we might as well stay here and park here for a little while, right? <laughs> Candace, you brought up gender. You, uh, 
when we're talking about black millennials in faith traditions, and we're talking about gender, we're talking about sexuality, those are some, some sticking points for a lot of millennials as to why uh, they leave organized faith traditions, right? So I wanna get your opinions um, and, and open really this conversation up. If we're gonna go there, we might as well go there, right? So if, if, if gender and sexuality um, are, are, are sticking points and are important, uh, important issues for millennials, what needs to be done in our faith traditions um, to begin to address these issues in a, in a full and honest way? I, I, I think that when you have a generation that everything is out in the open, right? Back in the day, you liked certain superstars or artists because there was some sort of like a secret, you know, you didn't, you didn't know how they lived, you know, you, you know, you didn't know that they ate Panda Express, you know. Uh, that's not this generation, right? So they're following celebrities and they know everything about that celebrity and still choosing to call them that icon and they know everything about them. So the church is going to have to have very real and honest and transparent conversations about gender, sexuality, how we got there, uh, the reason why it was allowed. For example, um, I was one of the ones that wrestled with this whole notion in the Baptist church that women could not preach. And I was like, what are you, what are you, what? Uh, <laughs> because the very first person that preached to me was my mama. You know, she was the one that taught me how to pray. And I came up and my father is, or was a pastor, but it wasn't my father that taught me how to pray. It wasn't my father that taught me the disciplines of church. It was my mom. So I could not digest that women could not be used by God. And then especially when you look in the Bible and you see all of the women who actually not only were used, but they ruled and they started churches and they ruled the church and Paul just checked in with them. Um, you, you know, we have to have those open conversations and actually admit that there was a time when church was used to enslave our women and that because there was a chauvinistic disposition from a lot of preachers and pastors who were intimidated by the, the knowledgeable black woman, that that's the reason why they continuously allowed it to foster. So we have to have those kind of real conversations that grandma and granddaddy probably don't really want to have because now we're starting to find out those behind the scenes things that you know you may think that we will look down on you upon but we'll actually respect you more for admitting that there's absolutely no reason why it is that we didn't allow women to preach other than the fact that we were intimidated by them the end and then we'd be like cool thanks for telling us that i appreciate you and i'll see you on sunday anyone else on that uh, i mean so so what's interesting to me, right, is that um, as a sister, and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like I probably shouldn't have told my grandma to live stream this, but, um, <laughs> but, but there is something inherently ungodly about a faith, a doctrine that tells me that I can't experience joy and pleasure, right? So, and that I have to wait until I am quote unquote chosen um, by somebody who's gonna be trifling anyway, right? That, um, you know what I'm saying? Like that I have to wait until, you know, he finds me. Um, and then only the pleasure should be reserved for the fact that I'm going to bring him a son, right? That there's something inherently ungodly about that. That, um, that even as black women are trying to navigate this world spiritually, we're also trying to do it very practically. Like, we have to, nav we have to very strategically maneuver through this world if a brother comes up to us and asks us for our name and our telephone number and we don't wanna give it to him, we don't even know if we're gonna end, come out of that exchange alive, right? So there are so many other forces that practically that practically beat us down every single day, and then you wanna tell me that I can't experience the one thing, intimacy, that will literally allow me to remember that I am human and remember that I am loved and worthy of love. 
because I don't have a ring on my left hand, right? Um, there's a way that millennials, uh, black millennials are pushing us to have a theological reformation that is long overdue, right? I would honestly say that I think that our grandparents and older generations are actually primed for these conversations. We just got leadership that will say behind the scenes to us, oh, I agree with you. I know, I know all of these things, but I can't preach it in my church, right? You have grandparents who, I was just talking with a grandmother a couple of weeks ago who is raising her granddaughter who came to her and said that she identifies, she, that she identifies as a young woman. Um, she's trans. This grandma was like, all, all she has is me. She said, I don't know nothing about that. Help me figure it out. I don't want my baby to go to hell. She ain't got no daddy. She don't have a mama. All she has is me. She is come and she could not go to her pastor because her pastor said, keep calling him a boy until he realizes that that's who God made him, right? So our grandparents, our communities are asking these questions. And I think that millennials, we are pushing forward this, this theological reformation to, to really begin to think through what it means to have faith, who God is. God is not just, you know, the gray haired bearded dude that, you know, that is petty the way that we have been taught that God is. Um, but I think that we are right for that, but we have to push leadership to go in those directions. So if this theological reformation, as, as you say, Candace, is not, has not happened, and in many spaces um, there is pushback for it happen, happening, then we're seeing millennials disengaging with these traditions, right? So uh, I like what uh, Tyree said. He said, I'm decolonizing, right, the work that's been done on me. So if they're leaving, where are we going? Right? That becomes the question. So if we're leaving these faith traditions, if we're walking out and saying, if I cannot be whole, if I can't be myself, if I can't stand in my truth, then I'll leave. And the research is showing that they're leaving. Where are we going? Brunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's real. Brunch is the new black church, right? Like, we will, we will give $50 and I mean, in New York, it's more than that. But we, we, will, we will tithe to brunch, right? Because we are at a table. You know, we just had some brothers go to Trump talking about seats at the table a couple of weeks ago. But like, we will go to, we will sit at that table at brunch, knowing every single person around that table with us affirms who we are. And God will meet us there, right? So we're going to we're going to brunch. We go into the kickbacks. We go into you know we we're going to museums. We're we are in so many spaces that we are forcing the church to. We're in the streets protesting, right. right? We are forcing the church to reckon with the fact that we are not that the spirit is not confined to four walls. And I think that the work that activists within the Black Lives Matter movement did on the ground in Ferguson, really forced the, the church, you know what I'm saying, to, to think through, no, we're not waiting on you, right? We're not waiting on you, we're not waiting on this Messiah to say that this is, this is the move, right? We are, we're finding different spaces. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, um, there, there are people who can speak to where statistically, we're finding ourselves and where we are going, but a lot of a lot of us are are on social media having hashtag church, right. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? where we have found a community of like-minded individuals, and we'll spend an hour refreshing a hashtag, knowing that we can get more in that hour on that hashtag than going to somebody's eight o'clock service right. and having a side eye half of the sermon, right? So I think that, that we are pushing people to realize that something that black folk have always known, and Dr. Braxton said it, is that spirit could never be confined, right? It could never be confined. And millennials are pressing folks to recognize that. And I, oh, uh, no, I, I, and I think going along with that, um, 
millennials are moving to any place where they can have constructive conversation that ends with, and then we're going to do this, rather than going to places where it is just be pacified, just wait, sooner or later it's gonna happen, joy comes in the morning. Um, they, they, they don't wanna hear that. Um, at, our, at our church, a lot of the things that I preach and a lot of things that our young adults do um, it talks about the problem, but I'm big on solutions. So if we're going to come together, we need to come together, talk about the problem, and then actually leave with a practical way to solve it. So we're not just going to have prayer meeting and a cake sale afterwards, you know. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to go out, and we're going to change policy, and we're going to rewrite some laws, and we're going to press some of these assembly members that come and take about five minutes about actually changing law that will affect us in a positive way and put some textbooks in our classrooms. So I think that that's where the millennials are going. Any place that when they leave from that brunch and have a mimosas, you know, <laughs> they, they leave from that place saying, and this is what we're going to do by the time we meet again. So that includes brunch and wherever that may be. Well, at least I think some of Bashir's work at Pew shows, some of the spaces that the millennials are going to are they're moving from historically black religious traditions to predominantly white congregations. So I'm sure some of you watch Joel Osteen. Um, that's a mega church as well. It's racially diverse, but still predominantly white. Rod Parsley as well as in Atlanta. And so what we're seeing is that increasing percentages of blacks are just leaving black spaces to go to white spaces. And we haven't quite figured out what that means when your racial consciousness is being shaped by Joel Osteen. <laughs> if I may. Okay. Um, that was shade, sir. <laughs> shade. I, 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 I was saying, this is tonight. My family watches Joe Osteen, and God bless them for that, as well as um, some other people that I just don't fully agree with. But what does it mean when we're black and we are religious, but our religion isn't, or our community isn't black? Right. Oh, I think after we're going to brunch and we're going to check our phones, church is the shade room, right? Like, mm. church is brunch, church is shade rooms, church is IG, church is Twitter, church is black Twitter, but also church is your therapist. Yeah. Mm. Because if we really wanna have this conversation, and I don't know if we really are, my newest pastor is my therapist. Yes. Because for much of my time within the religious confines that I found myself in, my church couldn't resolve the childhood trauma that I had the formative trauma, right, right. things you can't just pray away. So now I seek a, a licensed professional <laughs> who is able to deal with a black man who is navigating many spaces and who can speak directly to those mental issues. Uh -oh. Uh, I, I, I think I got an amen corner. <laughs> uh, I, I, who can speak to the mental issues that not only I'm facing, but many black men are facing, that only perpetuate the cycle of violence that black women like Candace have to survive against, right? And I think if more of us start to have that, that mental health conversation within the four walls of the church, we actually might get to the root of what we've really been praying about all along. Sure. Anything? On I, I mean, I'd just like to build on some of the, some of what's already been said with with a fairly fairly minor, but I think uh, important point, which is that um, what we don't see is we don't see people saying that they don't believe in God. It's not that that, that if you if you ask millennials, you ask black millennials, do you believe in God? They say yes, overwhelmingly. But then if you if you dig a little deeper, well, is, is that the God of the Bible? Right. <laughs> there you see some real differences. Huh. Younger folks are much more likely to say, no, I believe in a broader spirit. Uh, and, and whereas the, the older generations were much more committed to a, to a more, more specific biblical con concept of God. Um, so that's a change that we see over, over the generations. So, so that leads me into another question. I mean, I, I had a question about social media, but I, I'll, I'll come back to that because we kind of touched it. But I think you really are, are moving us um, to this conversation of spiritual but not religious, right? Um, that I, as you said, the data is showing that, I, that millennials are believing in God, but believing in God in a more broader 
an all-encompassing way. So my, my question is, is the popular uh, terminology spiritual but not religious, is the designation too simplistic, right? Um, are spirituality and religion uh, opposing realities, or are they related in important ways? Does spirituality need religion, and does religion need spirituality? I th so, so I think that on, on that point, um, so we've, we've explored this in some of our data, and one of the things we see is that most, for most Americans, including um, millennials, including um, uh, black American millennials, religion and spirituality are linked. The most common, if you ask people, do you consider yourself a religious person, and then separately ask, do you consider yourself a spiritual person? The most common response is yes to both. It's not an either or pattern. It's this idea that no, I can be religious and spiritual, and if I'm not being fulfilled by these things, I will leave both. Um, and increasingly we see um, among young people, the, sh the, the, number, the number of young people that say that they're neither spiritual nor religious. Um, is actually significantly larger than it is among older adults. That's not to say um, that we aren't seeing a growth in the spiritual but not religious. We are. Um, but this is broad across our society. It's not, it's not just among young people. Older people as well are increasingly saying that they're spiritual but not religious. It's just not the majority. The majority are saying that, that no, these things are linked for me. Anyone else? Um, I, I would think that a lot of times when people answer that question, it's from their own context, right? I don't think a lot of people are sitting there with the Webster Dictionary. So there, it's their own picture of when you say religious, you think about church. Sunday morning, all day service. And then you have, <laughs> I'm a PK, sorry, pastor's kid. Uh, and then you have spirituality, right? Which is about, you know, prayer or meditation or, you know, um, zoning in between you and God and having that, that inner peace. So I think when a lot of people are saying, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, they're saying, I, this is a generation, and I was just telling somebody this the other day. I said, you know, in the black church, there was a time where the black church was about what you looked like because that was the only place where you could look like something, right? That's where you could go and you could be a chairman of a deacon board and it actually mattered because you couldn't be CEO of anything else. So they went to church and they were chairmen and they were presidents of choirs and they thought they was really doing something great because that was where they could be, right? Now though, we have entrepreneurs and you have people by the time they're 25 running their own companies, making money. So they're no longer coming to church for position and title. They're, they're coming to church so that they can get that that inner peace, what Christ would say, would you want to be made whole? You know, they want to leave there being made whole. They want their peace. They need to know what it is that I need to center on, where I need to focus. What is God saying about this situation that's happening in my neighborhood right now? And because they're not getting that, they're going and they're getting what I like to term re religiosity, right? Choir sings the A and B selection, announcements from the announcement clerk, Preacher preach, he gonna hoop in E flat, and then we out of here. And nobody <laughs> brought me out of depression. And I'm sick of it, so now what I'm gonna do is go to the therapist and I'm gonna pray. I'm still spiritual, I'm still seeking God. I'm just not gonna go to church to do it because they not seeking him either. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this on my own time. So I think that's what that means by they're spiritual, but they're not religious. So, and, and, and we're gonna get ready to open, uh, take some questions from the audience, and we had uh, people submit questions that they wanna pose, but my question is, is that, is there any hope for black organized religion, right? And, and, and is there a future um, right, as millennials are, are disengaging or, um, or some of them are staying, right? Not all are disengaging. Some are staying in these organized faith traditions and, and, and staying through a lot of different things, right? But is there hope for these traditions that at, at one point were the bedrocks of our communities, right? Um, led, led movements. Um, chicken was fried in the basements of these places. Movements were paid for. People were, were sent to college from these places, right? Um, is, is there a future form um, 
And do we believe we still need them? Absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, I'll say for me, I am someone who my commitment to the church is as theological as it is feminist, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not leaving black church space because black church space is black women's space, right? Um, my mama worked in the church. My grandmama worked in the church. And for me, because wherever black women are, our presence immediately and instantly makes that space holy, right? So I'm not leaving the church because it is, it is black women's space. But I also love, because I'm not leaving the church, I love it enough to push it to be well, right? Um, we are still frying chicken. Like, you know, a full disclosure, Teddy and I grew up in the same church, right? That church gave us scholarships to go to school. You know, we got the same little Bible that they gave us every time, you know, somebody graduated and, and you know, like that. <laughs> you know, like, but, but, but it meant something, right? When we go back, and the elders and the senior citizens of that church can look at us and say, you was running around that church at five, look at you now, right? That means something not only to them, but it means something to me, right? I want my children to have that same experience. I want my children to have a healthier experience than I did, right? Um, we still are sending children, we still are sending young folk to college. We still, the, the number one, for many in our African, in our communities, the number one social service program in our community is the church. I mean, the, the money that comes in on Sunday is going right back out to emergency assistance Monday morning, right? And so we still need our congregations. Um, I will also say this too, that even though this is a conversation about um, black millennials and faith, I think that we also have to push our we have to push our churches to think more to think more intergenerationally about being healthy and whole because if we want to be real it ain't just the millennials that churches are being trifling towards right you know uh, if many of you may not know like if your if your grandmama or your granddaddy can't come to church for a certain amount of months having paid tithes for a certain amount of months, they're no longer on the roll, right? Which means that people who have served in churches for 50 and 60 and 70 years, because they are now 70 and 80 and 90 years old, they're disposable, right? So if, if we don't think through pushing conversations to say that this church space has to be as healthy for my grandma as it is for me, as it is for my daughter, then what will happen is, if we reclaim, if black millennials reclaim the church space, in 50 years, our grandchildren will do the same thing to us that's happening to our grandparents, right? And so we have to think, we have to really think through a, a, a theology and an ethic that, and I mean, we have it, hello womanism, hello black liberation theology, but, but we have to implement the, the theological aspects of wholeness and healing that really pushed us to think intergenerationally about what it looks like to have a healthy church. So there is hope, but we gotta do some work too. So I believe it, with Candace, I believe yes, there is hope. Um, my question and what I kind of wonder is, how will the black church look? Will it still have this normative African-American experience and this understanding of blackness or will the blackness, so their understanding of blackness begin to change over time? I tend to believe that it's going to change mm -hmm. in ways that may reaffirm or not reaffirm our racial identity. I, I, I would like to say, first of all, I really hope there is hope for the church, because I'm, <laughs> I'm a pastor. <laughs> so, so <laughs> no, but ser seriously, um, I think that there is hope for the church. Um, you know, the, the churches have to be willing to evolve. Mm -hmm. One thing that I love, I try to point this out often, and it, it, this messes with some people's theological understanding of God. When I'm like, you know, God evolved. They was like, what? I was like, he evolved in his approach to humanity, right? So in the beginning of the text, it's never Old Testament, New Testament, it's all one Testament. But in the beginning of the, of the text, 
you have God who dealt with them in the mountain. You come to the mountain, he's mystical, he's invisible, boom, 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 you know, clouds, Moses' voice, you know. And then when that didn't work, he sends his son through Christ, who is now tangible, right? Then it goes from that to the Holy Spirit which dwells within. And I just think that the church has got to be willing to just evolve and say, what is God calling the church to do now that will reach this next generation? And it did its thing for the previous generation. This next generation is really looking for a organization that will take care of its community that is around it, that will actually get out in the streets and take up the fight. And we saw that with what happened in Ferguson. And that's one of the biggest problems I know in the hood, in, in like Compton and Chicago and, and, and other areas, they want the church to be more apparent in everyday struggles that's happening. So when somebody gets killed and there's a drive-by, what is the pastor and those members actually going to do to try to bring down the crime rate in our inner city? So the, the, the preachers are going to have to look at how God is challenging us to evolve the church to minister to this generation. And the last thing, and this probably won't get an applause, one of the things that I don't like is how sometimes my generation and the millennials, oftentimes when they get frustrated with a thing, they leave it. And I tell people, you can't change anything from the outside. And so if everyone leaves the church, then the church will remain all the things that you hate about it. You have to stay, and sometimes you have to go to war. It even happens scripturally. Sometimes you gotta go to war until it is that God gives you victory in that institution, and then you get in position, and then you can actually change it. Oh, I got a Go, go ahead. So, so uh, one of the privileges I have uh, working at this fine institution is uh, the ability to investigate um, aspects about the black experience in the West, right? And so there's an exhibit behind me, which I curated, which I'm very proud of, called How Sweet the Sound. And I know that when the pastor fails and the deacon fails and the mother fails, gospel music holds yeah. us together. We all know <laughs> Mary Don't You Weep. We all know uh, all these amazing songs. So I had the leisure of being able to investigate what these songs meant to the people who wrote them. Like Thomas Dorsey, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lead me on, let me stay. Come on, y'all, y'all know these words. <laughs> these songs, when we didn't have the therapist that I referenced earlier, they carried us through depression and angst and frustration when we didn't have any insulation from white supremacy. Do you understand what I'm saying? And still carried us through. And so this exhibition behind me, I, it was dope to find out that Chance the Rapper might have re uh, referenced James Cleveland. But I know that my generation is not gonna pick up Andre Crouch. I know my generation knows what Andre wrote, right? But let's go back to the history of how it all started. And so this exhibition, I, I, I really, made it for the church, like the black church in particular that's here in South Central. But every single day I see um, people from uh, South Asia. <laughs> um, I see people from um, India. I see people who aren't even of the same faith, who write out cards and say, I'm agnostic. But even gospel music has pricked my heart. Do you see what I'm saying? And so I think that if the four walls fails, our music saves. And I hope that... Um, yeah, that's a word, right? Yeah, no, I was like, uh, yeah, I was like, our music saves. And, and I, hope, I hope that, um, that we can rely on the composition of some of the greatest composers that our communities have ever uh, um, had, because uh, we can rely on what they wrote for us when the scriptures um, may be foggy. So I, I said that was my last question. I do have one more uh, before we open up. But so, right, we're, we're talking about hope right, and there being hope uh, for our religious spaces, right, and I want to make sure that we are inclusive of religious spaces and, and talking about um, hope for all, but is there, is it religious spaces job to try to reclaim those that left, right? Um, is it our job to try to reclaim those who say that I'm spiritual but not religious, I'm um, I'm no longer, you know, a part of these organized faith traditions. I found something that works for me, 
right? How do our religious spaces begin to work alongside uh, millennials and others who find other routes, right, or find other spaces and say, this works for me, but I still want to be a part of this institution because I know what it's meant to our community and I want to work alongside. Is there room for that type of work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, one, is it our job to go and reclaim? That's the whole parable of leave the 99 go get the and one. go get the one. Yes. It is absolutely our job to go and reclaim those um, that have become frustrated with the church. As long as it's done with transparency and honesty. You know, it's not always the devil that took them away. Tell them the truth. Me as a pastor, yes, sometimes I want to cuss everybody out too. I understand exactly where you're coming from. Don't leave me. You're a good member. You know, <laughs> stay. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> you know, everything is not divine. No. <laughs> you know, tell me that you understand, you know, that, that, that you're frustrated as well. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, same thing with Jesus. You know, he, when he first meets Peter, he tells Peter, what, drop your nets, right? I'm going to make you fishermen of men. And then we find in the text later, even all the way after the crucifixion and the resurrection, that what was Peter doing? He was still fishing, which meant that there was a season where Jesus had to walk with him when he didn't drop what it is he told him to drop. Mm -hmm. And he got to know Peter. Peter got to know him. And then in time, when Peter was ready, he made the decision to go ahead and say, okay, I'll drop these nets now because I trust you because I know you and you know me and we have relationship. And so I think that it is room for us to work with those that we may not necessarily theologically agree with, right? But we need to find those spaces where the struggle is coming, right? So I never agreed with the whole thing, you know, where churches were completely resistant against like, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that, because I'm sitting there saying, well, they're fighting the same fight that you're fighting, so just fight it together and then have a theological discussion later at Starbucks, you know? So there's, 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 there's room for us to work together and then let God, uh, I want to say, like, weave us together, like, in a weave. I love to see women when they get their hair done, and what they do is they line up that track to that hair, right? And then, and then, listen, then when they line that track up, then they sew it in. But it has to be in a line, there's a part where it lines up before it's sewn in first. And that's what I'm talking about. You got, you got to have. Walk together. Then let God weave us in. If I was in church, if I was in church, I would tell you to slap your neighbor high five, but I'm not. Well, I don't have a neighbor, so I'm going to slap there. So I, I I want to open it up. We have people to submit questions online, and we have people that are submitting questions here. And so I really uh, want to get as many questions in before we go on our first break uh, to prepare for our next panel. But this question uh, is coming from uh, Clinton in Fort Washington, Maryland. Uh, hi, Clinton. Uh, how do you think religious hypocrisy has affected the numbers of those who attend church? And he uses as an example the recent Catholic priest scandal, right? How can churches change the perception that this, uh, and he's saying churches and other spaces, um, change the perception that this is not everyone in faith traditions, right? This is not everyone. Yeah, I think, I think the first, and I, I think that goes along with what uh, Pastor was saying. Um, first, I think an apology will go a long way. Um, if, if, if many of you remember, I think it was a few weeks ago, um, the, the hashtag church hurt was trending on social media. And instead of pastors acknowledging that that was a very real experience for so many people, they flipped it and made it a joke. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that we saw a lot of people hurt in the church, right? Which is, which is how I can, I, I push back with you a little bit, Pastor, when, I, when you say, you know, um, don't leave because, you know, we have to, sometimes we have to stay and fight the battle. The truth is that so many of us have already been casualties of warfare, right? But there's so many of us are just wounded that we don't, we don't even have the strength to fight, right? Because 
we're tired of fighting against institutions and for institutions that don't, aren't even honest about who they are and who they've been to us, right? So you can have a pastor, I mean, I was, I was one of those children. My mama was pregnant in the church with me and was supposed to stand in front of the pastor in front of the congregation and apologize, and she refused, right? And so she had to go to another church. Later on, found out that pastor had like all these kids that wasn't with his own wife, right? And so it was like, you know, you got a baseball team full of children outside of, you know, your marriage, but because my mama wasn't married, you know, so, so and that's, that is only an example of several things you know, like we have these pastors who would talk about tithing and the fact that we are not blessed because we're not giving enough to the church. And then six months, a year and a half later, a scandal breaks and we see where the money was actually going, right? So if we are not honest, if churches are not honest, and I do believe that even the pastors who, if you are a pastor and you didn't do any of this stuff, you bear a lot of the responsibility and the burden to say, look, I represent a, a brotherhood. <laughs> I, I represent some folks that did some dirty and are still doing some dirty stuff. On behalf of us, I apologize. And I can guarantee you that this space will not be that kind of space, right? And then that means that pastors got to do some work. So the congregation that I'm a part of now, the pastor that I, that I have now, love him dearly. Because when we, we can have conversations if something was said in a sermon that made me feel a certain kind of way. Like I can say, hey, I, don't, I didn't really rock with what that was and what you said, and we have a conversation, right? He is in tune to one, who his congregation is. What he needs to do in order to reconcile the fact that he is trying to bring back people who've been hurt. So I think that if we, if, if we are going to be honest about conversations around black millennials and faith, we have to be honest and say that the hurt is real. And if we're gonna do anything about bringing back in, working alongside, because the truth of the matter is, is that some millennials may respect the church, may say, okay, what y'all doing is good over there, but I don't even wanna walk alongside of you because of how you treated X, Y, and Z, you know what I'm saying? And so if we're gonna be collaborative, we gotta own some stuff. So I wanna, thank you, Candace. Um, and thank you, Clint, for that question. I do wanna get uh, about three questions that our audience had, and I wanna pose those to you. Um, I, and I think this, this question is um, really what we're here about. Uh, here for is to really talk about the breadth of the African-American religious experience, right? And so this question came in and it says, where do black atheists fit in the conversation, right? When we're talking about um, faith and we're talking about encounters, I really want to get with you, start with you, Bashir, to see what is the research saying about um, African-Americans that are identifying as atheists? The research on, on that is really interesting. Um, I, I talked before about the increasing share of, um, uh, of black Americans, black millennials specifically, um, who are disaffiliating from religious institutions um, and who are saying that they're religiously unaffiliated. Um, but that's not actually the same as the share that say that they're atheists. That's not the same as the share that say that they, have no, that they, they don't believe in God. Um, the share that say they don't believe in God remains relatively small. Um, most people, who, who are disengaging from, from, from the faith communities are doing it and maintaining some tie to, to a higher power, even if it isn't a biblical concept of God. Um, which isn't to say that there aren't, you know, as, as you mentioned, there, there definitely is a, a section of the black community that's sort of explicitly and devoutly atheist because there is an incredible diversity within the community. Um, we've, we've talked, you know, we primarily we've been talking about the, 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 the church um, and the sort of Christian traditions and, and, you know, that still makes up the largest group, but there are, you know, there are black Muslims, there are black Buddhists, there are black Hindus, there are black members of, that, that are sort of reviving the traditional African religions. Um, and so we need to keep all of that in mind as we talk about what does black faith look like. It looks like all of those things, including atheists. 
and, and I'm excited for the second panel because we have such a diversity of, of perspectives, right? And to really show that, that depth and the breadth. Um, and I wanna, again, for the sake of time for this first panel, I really wanna get to the second question uh, that someone in the audience posed. The question was, uh, we touched on sexuality and the practicality regarding spiritual, uh, spirituality and women. Can you elaborate, and I, I guess we'll start with you, Candace, um, can you elaborate on what that looks like in practice uh, and the interaction between this and the church? Um, I think in um, I think in practice, one of the things that I have um, really been moved by um, are the number of sisters who have personal altars in their homes, um, the number of sisters who are uh, turning to um, traditional African um, uh, African religions to mysticism. Um, to create this fullness of uh, their spirituality. Um, I get my full disclosure. I go to Bible study and I get my tarot cards read, right? Um, and one of, my, one of my humbles was like, you believe in that? And I said, I trust, I trust black women with all forms of me, right? With, um, with all forms of my health. And so my, my spirituality, and I believe this, I believe that every black woman should have a spiritual care team. Um, uh, and these are people who are made up of folks that she can go to for spiritual health and wholeness. Um, I have pastors in my care team. I have a Yoruba priestess in my care team, right? Um, people who can see the aspects, various aspects of my experience from completely different perspectives. And I think that that is what, um, although that is not new to black women, because we've always had big mama, auntie them, who, you know, could, could, could dibble and dabble in, in, in some certain things. Um, I think that black millennial women are embracing it more out in the open and pulling from different various, um, different aspects of faith traditions and not feeling like giving, not, I won't say not feeling like, but giving themselves permission to say that all these various pieces can come together to create a full and robust spirituality. And I think, and I'll say this as someone who is as, as committed to the black church as I am, Black Christian women are not going, millennial black Christian women are not going to have the fullness of their spiritual experience fulfilled through the church. It's just not gonna happen. If you are a sister who, particularly if you are a sister who has a certain uh, ideology and assurance and acceptance of yourself, you're not going to be fully welcomed in the church, even in progressive spaces, because we can get in that conversation about how some progressive spaces, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, right? So, so there's a certain way in which our progressive spaces aren't fully there where they need to be on issues of gender and sexuality. But I really believe that if black women, particularly black Christian women, if they are going to have a spirituality and a personal relationship with the divine that is sustaining, it cannot fully reside and be dependent upon their experience in the church. It has to be broader than that. Um, and I think that the, if we go back very quickly, if we go back to the work of, um, of Alice Walker and womanism, if we go back to um, some sisters who are doing some amazing work in womanism and womanist theology, we will see that there is a need to push us to go outside of the church for wholeness. Um, and that is a, a practical, those are practical steps that um, sisters need to take in order to really fully be well. Well, we're gonna give this black woman the last word, okay? Uh, can we give all of our panelists a round of applause? So when we return from this intermission, we're going to have our next panel called Faith in Community, and you are 
up for another treat of a group of millennials that span the breadth of African-American religious life. Uh, so give us a little time. We'll be right back. Thanks so much. allows people, hopefully, to understand the power they have to change their own lives. The Oprah Winfrey Show was uh, a gift to me, and I believe a gift to the culture. I wanted everyone watching to know that there is a story just like yours. A million dollars for Sky Academy. One of the reasons I love this museum so much is because you must know from whence you've come. One, two, three, four. I got something to tell you, too. God Talk provided by DAF Media, your live event and branding video provider.
right. We are back. How many of you enjoyed your break? Y'all are too quiet. How many of you enjoyed your break? How many of you enjoyed the exhibit? Ah. Well, I am excited to jump right in uh, to our second panel uh, entitled Faith in Community. And I'm going to jump right in and introduce our panelists and get uh, straight to our questions. So starting from my right, we have M. Mariba, who is a multifaceted musician uh, with the life story of young Rolling Stone. She just released a stunning visual for her single Black Truck, produced by Ninth Wonder, and is gearing up for her first major label debut this year. Welcome, Mariba. <laughs> Next, we have Siobhan uh, Taylor, is a member of the Black Skeptics Los Angeles, a community-based, all-volunteer nonprofit organization that provides resources and education for non-believers, humanists, and secularists of color. Welcome, Siobhan. <laughs> Beside her is, I call her now my new big sis, <laughs> Debbie Brown is a veteran radio and television personality uh, and author. Debbie most recently held the position of music director at number one rated, and number one rated host for iHeartMedia's 93.7 The Beat. Welcome, Debbie Brown. Beside Debbie is Hussein Abdul, is a sports mediator, athletic transition coach, and keynote speaker. During his seven-year NFL career uh, for the Minnesota Vikings and Kansas City Chiefs, Hussein used his status and platform to speak on issues such as sports, concussions, mental health, social injustice, and he educated worldwide audiences on Islam. Welcome, uh, Hussein. Next, we have Travell Anderson, who is a film reporter with the Los Angeles Times, covering the intersections of diversity and Hollywood with a focus on black queer film. Welcome, Travell Anderson. <laughs> and might I add, he always likes you to know that he went to Morehouse College. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, I'll shout out Hamptons, just because they did that. <laughs> Oh, we're in the building. That's what I'm talking about. Black millennials, that's what I'm talking about. And our last speaker, he's over there at the DJ booth, but he is a part of this panel. DJ B. Hen, who is a resident DJ. He's a resident DJ on ABC's Good Morning America in New York City and is a standout contestant on VH VH1's premier DJ competition show, Master of the Mix. Welcome, DJ B. Hen. So I'm gonna jump right into the conversation. I asked the first panel to uh, go around and identify how they identify as, as it relates to faith. So I'm gonna ask them to do the same thing before we jump right into our questions. I'll start on this end with Travell. Um, I, Travell Anderson, I have Baptocostal origins and histories. Um, and uh, I grew up in a non-denominational church. Um, um, today, I believe in God, uh, and I believe God is a black trans woman. Shut out, okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to y'all. May God's peace and blessing be upon you. My name is Hussein Abdullah. I uh, appreciate that, brother. Um, I would like to say that uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and all the different uh, unique uh, viewpoints. And I would like to say that anything that you hear good from me, um, please uh, pray to God. And anything that, that's uh, wrong or if it's... Uh, comes off as inconsiderate, please forgive me as an individual, and I am a Muslim. Uh, I'm Debbie Brown. I'm led by God to seek wholeness, to be of service, and to be love. I consider myself a seeker of all things. Um, Siobhan Taylor, I am an agnostic atheist. I was raised Pentecostal, and then I became agnostic atheist. I'm Marian Mariba, and I was raised uh, in a non-denominational Christian church, and I identify as a believer in God and spiritual and ever-evolving. Mm, I like that. You hear the snaps out there for it. Huh? Yeah, I see. All right, let's jump right in. I am going to start uh, with Mariba. Um, 
and then really open this, this question uh, to, up to all of our panelists because I've actually had an opportunity, full transparency, with some of them to have conversations throughout this week. So I know the answers to a lot of these questions, but I think you ought to know the answers to a lot of these questions. So uh, the first question, at what point in your life's journey did you become aware of your spiritual identity or have a spiritual awakening? And do you wish that spiritual consciousness had developed sooner rather than later in life? I remember I was around 13 um, and I had been starting to have a lot more questions than my parents wanted me to have about our religious practices. And one night I was, I was falling asleep and I didn't know then what sleep paralysis was. The, you know, when you, you're falling asleep and your body um, isn't responsive but you're still awake. And I started panicking. And in that moment, I, I heard what I believe to be the voice of God. And it was kind of like a vibration going through my body. And I felt this feeling of peace and understanding that I had never felt in the church, kind of felt opposite of everything that I was starting to feel about the church. And uh, I just kind of, I think of that moment as a signifying moment for me that told me that I would be okay and that I would find my own way, but that it was time for me to start um, answering my own questions. Yeah, and not looking to my family to answer them for me. That's powerful. Anyone else? So, um, like I was telling you, I was raised Pentecostal. I was raised in a very strict Pentecostal church. You had to wear a skirt over your pants if you walked into the church. Um, but it was also, um, it was very cultish in that the pastor claimed to be a prophet and we basically had to get permission to do, if you wanna go to prom, you gotta ask the prophet. If you wanted to go to join the cheerleading squad, you gotta ask the prophet. Um, it, but, it, it, but it practiced um, pretty much traditional Christian things, but it was like a little extraness on top of it. Um, and so because of how strict it was and how indoctrinated I had become, because it was a part of my household, um, I, my father, my grandmother were very, very much into, into this church. And I didn't really know much of the outside world because I mean, I went to a public school and all those things, but at the same time, when you're indoctrinated in your mind, you don't see the world the same way that other people see the world. I see it that way now, but at the time, it was like, I'm in war with all you demons and devils, and if I, you know, anybody who basically isn't inside my church or associated with it somehow, something's wrong with them, and they're not really following the man of God, and all this nonsense, right? And because I was so indoctrinated with it, I didn't see the rest of the world until I left it. Basically, I went to college, I went right up here to USC, and I started to meet other Christians who could party. Like, we weren't allowed to listen to music that wasn't Christian. How could these people have a whole party playing TI, you know? <laughs> what is this? Um, so I, after I joined them and I was partying and stuff, having a great time, I still had more questions. I gotten so busy with school as well because I was working four jobs and going to school. I couldn't go to church as much. By the way, I was in church like five to six days a week. You were there for choir practice, Bible, two, uh, two, we had two night services. On top of Sunday service, you were there literally all day until the prophet decided he was done. And he was like, okay, you guys can go now. Like, like literally could be there till one in the morning. And then he'd shame you in front of everybody if you tried to leave. So for me, not being a part of that is after being uh, so involved for so long, it became really noticeable that I hadn't been showing up. Never mind the fact that I was going to school, I had my own apartment, I was struggling to just graduate. And they were wanting to know why I'm not there in all their programs. I got a call from my dad telling me, well, the first lady wants to talk to you. Um, I get down there and she basically starts asking me all these questions and acting like I deceived her when I went to college and got an apartment. Oh, look, stuff that didn't make any sense. And then she asked me if I had a boyfriend. And at that time, keep in mind, like you're taught that the man of God is supposed to tell you who you're supposed to make, you know, be your partner or whatever. And I had a boyfriend, but we were moving so slow because I was so, you know, <laughs> uh, we hadn't even kissed yet. And this lady's asking me if we, you know, so well, are you involved? I didn't know what that meant. I just thought she meant, you know, or, do you know him? I didn't know what it meant. So I said, yeah, she, she starts getting so upset with me and basically called me a whore said I went off to college, became a whore. I didn't even kiss this boy yet. And I thought he was being nice about that because he was definitely trying to sleep with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, but, but that was my moment. And she asked me, and I left that day, and she asked if I was coming back. And I said, yeah. I've never been back there since then. And I was 19 years old. Wow. Um, I think, so I didn't grow up in the church at all. I was raised by a single mom who the extent of kind of knowing God was the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And I did that every night. Um, but other than that, when I tell you I didn't know one person's name in the Bible other than Jesus, I hadn't heard of anything, really. Um, she was busy, too busy for church, and that just was not a part of when you're kind of surviving, that's an extra part that kind of got left to the side. Um, around 16 was the first time I ever went to a church, and I loved it, and I felt, I felt so deeply a part of everything. And for me, that equated to seeking out community. That was like, for me, the OG version of what we now call finding your tribe, right? So. That to me made me want to be open and find people that believe things that I believe or find people that I could learn from. Um, so to that extent, I would, I prayed a lot. I, I talked to God, I thought I knew God, but to be quite honest, I was intellectualizing it that whole time. I knew what to say, I knew what to do. I knew he was there. Okay, it all makes sense. The first time I surrendered to God, I was like 25, 26. That's the first time that God became the most important aspect of my life um, that has remained to now. And for me, God being the most important aspect is me being in a constant state of self-inquiry, being in a constant state of realizing that in every moment I'm a teacher and I'm a student and having that exchange with the people that I meet and the people um, that, that I cross paths with. So. Yeah, for me, it wasn't until, you know, a little bit later in my 20s that God became what he is now for me. Um, for, my, for myself, uh, I've always knew God and had a relationship with God as far back as I can remember. Um, and I only developed it more and more as, uh, as I got picked on. I'm the little kid, I'm the bow-legged kid, I'm the ashy kid, I'm the kid with asthma, I'm, uh, I'm from a family of 12. Um, so all these different things, uh, even in terms of uh, being black. My parents, like I was born here, a Killer King Hospital right here in LA. Um, and we were not black enough because our names are Arabic, right? Hussein Abdullah, Hamza Abdullah, Abbas Abdullah, Haji Abdullah. Um, and then even sometimes in Muslim spaces with immigrants, we weren't Muslim enough. So it was interesting how my relationship with God kind of kind of furthered and I got closer. And I had to separate um, what people do and kind of what their misgivings are, what their sins are, what their hypocritical nature is. Um, and I had to separate that with who I'm worshiping because I'm not doing it for any of you all. I'm not here to please any of you all. I'm not here to sugarcoat anything for any of you all or anybody else. I'm here to be a servant um, to God. And uh, through that, uh, that's kind of my continuous uh, life journey. Um, so I came out of the birth canal and was thrown into the church. Uh, my grandmother was a pastor uh, and everybody did church stuff because when grandma said we're going to church, the entire house, the entire you know family line is going to church. Um, but um, I'd say that I didn't really have kind of a, a spiritual awakening. Um, <laughs> somebody gonna think I'm blasphemous. Um, it was on the dance floor at Bulldogs in Atlanta, which is a gay club. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know. Um, and for me, uh, having grown up in the church, having been, you know, one of those kids that they throw up there for, you know, the, the revivals to give a little kid sermon or whatever, um, that was the first time that I was just like in a space and I felt fully affirmed and I felt that I saw people um, and they had given me energy and we shared energy in that space that allowed me to go out into the world and conquer it and do what I needed to do. Um, those are the things that I was told that the church and going to church was supposed to provide. Um, but it wasn't until I went to the club that I actually got that. 
Look, I, I the club could be a space. <laughs> I, I definitely think music is the strongest form of love, so I understand how you had that experience. Um, my spiritual awakening, I, I think I thought it was supposed to come when I was baptized when I was 17. I didn't grow up in the church, but I began going to church when I was 16, 17, 18. Um, I, we, as a military brat, moved a lot of places, and when we moved back to my hometown of Baltimore, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And ultimately, she succumbed to a 14-month battle with breast cancer. And it was at that time that many people within the church led me to want to get baptized because I was fearful that I could leave this earth at any given time. And so I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I wanted to, you know, acknowledge him as my Lord and Savior. Um, eventually, you know, as, as, a, as a practicing Baptist, it didn't work for me. And I think largely it didn't work because I wish I had met Christ before I met the Christians. But my experience with Christians... My experience with many Christians left me kind of confused, and, and it, it felt like everything in my existence was sinful. Um, after relocating to Los Angeles uh, after college, I uh, was introduced to Soko Gakkai uh, Buddhism, SGI Buddhism, and I gravitated toward that largely because it allowed me to be in the driver's seat. I understood that I was the cause and not the effect of everything that transpired in my life. We, I, th I practiced uh, that for many years. We, we largely focused on Namyo Horenge Kyo, which means devotion to the mystic law of cause and effect through vibration and sound. I can get more to that later. But uh, eventually I even stepped away from the SGI practice because I, I realized that so much of everything was, that was within me needed to be, I needed to be spiritually fed in a different way that didn't necessarily, wasn't a part of a group. So at this point I practice mostly mindfulness and meditation outside of any organized religion. Mm. Thank you. Y'all have some experiences that we, we got to dig in. We, we got to dig into, right? This, this, is, this is black religion, right? Um, this is black millennials, right? This, these are um, real experiences and real voices, right? And real, and real things. So I want to jump into um, another question in how do you define um, or depict God? the divine or the sacred? Are these images and sensory artistic experiences that illustrate your definitions? Are there any uh, sensory artistic experiences that illustrate your definition or depictions of God, the divine, um, or the sacred? Doesn't okay. matter who's uh, <laughs> For me, God is a feeling, he is the energy in every space. When I, when I previously, previously said that, you know, I surrendered to God at the age that I did, it was because I was battling depression and I learned how to meditate. And meditation changed my life because that was the first time I was aware of being present in that exact moment and not in thinking about the past, not in reaching towards the future. And that's the moment that God spoke to me the loudest. And I think that that is a piece that is often missing in our relationship with God. It's, it's, you know, a lot of times it's focusing on asking him for things and talking to him, talking at him, sometimes um, being upset with him, but not being quiet and being still to listen to him. So for me, God is in the stillness of my day. He is me being very deeply present into what is happening now in this moment. Um, so he, yeah, that's what he looks like. He looks like stillness for me. I think he looks like me. I think he looks like you. I think he, she, they, whatever. Because I look at it like this. I, I think the concept, when I look at, the, look at the, a lot of the religious theology around God and the concept of God, God is a creator, God is powerful. You're a creator, you're powerful. And I, I, I look at those things and those scriptures and I look at them as something that I can internalize for myself not because I actually literally believe that these things happen the way that they, they're, they're depicted in these stories. I more so look at it like, what can I actually gain from it? And I'm not saying I even sit there and read the Bible. It's not just listening to people. When you go to a grocery store, people like to quote you scriptures for no reason, you know? And I used to, when I first became an atheist, when I realized I, I was atheist, I, I used to get upset about it because you have to remember, if those of us who were hurt in the church, that stuff is very triggering. And we don't think about that. We just assume that, you know, people are going to be okay with it and that you just assume this person is, is down with whatever it is that you're down with. And that's 
a little unfair and it's also, like I said, very triggering. However, because later once I've eased down a little bit and I really calmed down, I started saying, okay, am I, what am I really upset about? This person who's quoting the scripture to me isn't really trying to hurt me. They're trying to bless my day. That's a beautiful thing when someone wants to bless your day. And I learned to be able to say, okay, that to me is this God, right? I don't believe in God in, in, in the same way a lot of people here do, but I do believe in myself and I do believe this person was trying to have, help me have a good day, didn't want me, wanted me to feel good, wanted me to go to the grocery store and buy the stuff that I wanted and not go up to the cash register and say decline. So I, I accept that now. You know, if you want to quote me a scripture or give me a prayer, I accept it because I understand where it's coming from now. But also be aware that that can be very triggering for people who are coming out of those spaces where that was meant and sent to harm them. Hmm. That's real. That's good. I'd like to uh, touch on that. Um, God, um, God describes, him, describes himself in the Quran, and even before that, um, he tells us to be aware of, in Arabic, what's called our nafs. And if you think of in English, I think everybody's familiar with the ego. Um, so your ego or your lower desires. Um, and because he tells us to be aware of it because we'd follow it and we'd end up uh, worshiping it. And throughout human history, people have created gods to satisfy themselves. And uh, God has a, he has a description. And he says that there is nothing like him. Um, and so if someone wants to carve a statue of God, if someone wants to make God a trans woman, if someone wants to worship the sun as God, you can do whatever it is that you want to do. But the creator of the heavens and the earth and of all of us, he already had, has a description and he said there's nothing like him. Hmm. I, I believe God is, um, I resonated with a lot of the things that you were saying. I believe that God, um, for me, is a lot like the wind in the sense of it moves through every person. Um, and God can find you in any moment um, of any day. And I think that a lot of times for me, what was difficult for me, the confusion that Christianity caused was I could never imagine God as a he. I could never imagine God as this, this looming thing in the sky that I could envision. I always felt like God was the feeling of kindness or of being heard or seen or treated like, um, treated with care by one another. So I feel like God exists within me and within, within all of us. And it's kind of our decision how much we want to embrace that and believe that and allow that to radiate from us to other people. And I think the way that we can affect other people is us showing that God inside of us. So um, that's the way that I relate to God now is how can I be God and how can I serve the God within me by the way that I affect other people? I think I used to think God uh, was a man. Um, and uh, that's when I saw uh, uh, and allowed a kind of religion or spirituality to be something negative, and that's because it was men in my life who were inflicting the pain on me. And so God has to be a man, because God said that something's wrong with me, and I'm feeling pain right now, so he has to be a man. Um, but then once I began to kind of uh, just kind of allow myself to move through the world, um, the reason why I say God for me is a black trans woman, because it's black trans women who have given me the most love that I've ever felt. Um, and it, that feels like what we would term to be good, um, and God is supposed to be good, and so God must be a black trans woman because they have just loved me and poured into me and seen me in ways that men in particular and other folks within you know, the church that we, we lift up and we give positions and we put on pedestals have it. Mm. Mm. I believe God is the omnipresence of grace, favor, and mercy within our lives. I believe there's God within each and every one of us. I don't believe it's necessarily God is outside of us. And I also believe there's a direct correlation between God and the universe. So often we praise to different gods depending on what the religion is, but I think it's all the same. 
So what, what role, um, and, and, and it was touched on some, but I, I really want to bring it up. Um, what role does sensuality, sexuality, intimacy, um, embodiment play in your understanding of God, the divine, or sacred? Uh, I had to undo a lot of stuff. The way your questions are phrased, <laughs> it's hard for me to answer it directly in the same way, but I do want to offer a perspective that adds to that. Um, I was taught that sex was a negative thing. Sex is bad. That's what bad girls do. I, re I remember, and I remember um, Candace was talking about what happened to her mother in church. That, they would do that at my church. If you were a pregnant teen, you had to go up in front of the church and apologize. And I never forgot the first time I saw that. And I felt hurt for her. I actually had to do that later, but not because I was pregnant, but because my father beat me and they made me apologize to my dad in front of the church. And, um, but that idea of shaming people for doing something that's natural, for doing something that's healthy, something that you should be able to do, um, is, is part of the reason why I think some people also leave that space. Because you learn, I remember the, I, the first time I had sex, I had a panic attack. So I felt so guilty because I wasn't married. I wasn't even a Christian anymore. And I still affected me so deeply to the point where after that I didn't have sex again for another five years. And so when we talk about sexuality and spirituality, some, spirituality, some spiritual belief systems are designed to oppress sexuality and usually women's sexuality. Because I remember one time, I, it, was in a, it was a meeting we had in Daughters of Zion, one of the many things we had to do at church. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, Candace? Um, one of the many things that I do now, but I remember in that meeting and I asked, how come it's so, how come the girl has to apologize and not the boy? And, or why is it bad for the girl to have sex? And there isn't much conversation around boys. And the first lady in our daughter's design meeting said, because the um, girls have to bring the baby home. I never forgot that statement because it still didn't make any sense. <laughs> but, but, but that, but that's, that's an example of how sexuality was, you know, was taught to the point where when I became, became sexually active, it took me years to really understand that this is healthy. I'm not a bad person. There's nothing wrong with me. This is totally okay. A big part of the way that I love God is deeply rooted in me seeking wholeness for myself and in me practicing self-inquiry. Self-inquiry meaning I ask myself questions about absolutely everything so I can get to the root of how I feel so that I can be healed and be closer to hearing God's voice. So in that sense, um, you know, I didn't hear, and this is gonna sound crazy to some of you, but I had never even heard the concept of waiting till you get married until after I had had sex for the first time. I, it wasn't a part of my life. I didn't know that was a thing. And I remember after I lost my virginity, I was like, oh, wait, what? You know, and that brought into, <laughs> They didn't tell me that. What am I doing? You know, <laughs> I miss <that>. um, <laughs> but you know, I think there's so much shame associated with having sex and there is nothing wrong with having sex. There's nothing wrong with the act of it, but what we should all be doing before we're intimate with anyone is checking in with ourselves as to what our motivation is for doing it. You know, um, I think for some people, if you are looking for sex to fill a void in you, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be having it. If you are looking at, for sex to be a tool to get someone to like you or to pay attention to you or to give you something you want, if sex is transactional, then it's not healthy for your spirit at all. Um, but if you're looking to sex because that's something you're actually enjoying or a way that you want to express yourself with that person, I think that we absolutely need to get rid of the shame involved in it. Because it's, at this point, and I'm sorry, but you know, it's really, there, it's very problematic, the idea of only have sex once you get married with the person you get married to. Because there's so many, so many different scenarios of why we find ourselves in marriages. So many marriages are, failing, so then they don't talk about the next step, so then are you a reborn virgin after you get divorced and waiting until you get married again to have sex, or is it a free-for-all? You know, like there's just, 
there's just so much gray area into what that actually means that it never gets unpacked. Mm. I think, um, so I think in, in addition to so many of the, the traditional black churches uh, uh, oppressing their women, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of them also uh, oppress and marginalize uh, femininity more than anything. Um, and so it, it's, it's not so much about your body, and at least in my experience, and more about how you embody um, and express something that they feel you shouldn't be. Um, and so, and it's only okay if like you're quiet about it, you don't say about it, right? So it's the choir director in every church who everybody knows is gay, but we don't talk about it, right? Or it's the, the tambourine player who just do it a little too well, right? <laughs> But we don't talk about it, and it's okay. But when they start bringing their partner around, or they start holding hands with their partner, then you know the table is shaking just a little. Um, I think that's one of the reasons. Uh, somebody on the previous panel mentioned how I think it was Candace mentioned how so many of us are are, are wounded, um, and other people have talked about how they go to church and they they find these spiritual spaces to to feel whole. Um, I feel like the church has created a hole in me. Um, and for me, I haven't been into a church outside of funerals in six or seven years. Um, and that's as someone who similarly to everybody else was like in church every single day for whatever reason. Um, and so like when I think about church these days, it's not, it's not a place I want to be. Um, because it's a place that generally speaking doesn't make space for me, doesn't allow me to express and live myself as I am. Um, and it, it, it's full of so much hypocrisy, it's full of so many secrets, it's full of, it's full of just these attitudes and these energies that aren't about healing. They aren't about what I believe God to be, which, which is love. They aren't about bringing people to the table and uplifting them. It's about tearing them down, it's about beating them up, it's about, you know, praying the gay away, it's about thinking that they're, you know, people are dirty. Um, and, and that, for me, is something that uh, I don't necessarily gel with. Um, I would like to say that um, the trauma that, uh, that people have faced, um, I mean, please forgive us, them, whomever um, that it was. I have people in my family, um, close family, that have uh, had those similar experiences, and um, they also associated that immoral behavior with God and with religion. And um, that could be the furthest thing from the truth, although the people who may have done it um, used religion and used God to justify it. Um, there is nothing wrong with sex. That's how we all got here. Um, <laughs> there is a level of morality that should accompany it, uh, though. And um, we, again, uh, we all have desires, and uh, we struggle against those to gain a closeness to God because he's the one who gave us the moral law. Um, and he said, this is how you get closer to me. That's how you fulfill that spiritual void that we're all seeking. Um, and when we do away with that, and we want to fulfill our desire now, but we still want God to do everything for us, um, we kind of have to check ourselves. So again, uh, no one should face abuse. No one should face harm. No one should face any type of trauma, even though as a black community in this space, we've all went through it. Um, at the same time, we should strive for a moral uprightness and uh, a piety associated with what uh, God said is pious. And I'm saying that, and, and I'm not perfect. I got one of my college boys here and he can dish. I'm, I'm, I'm being real. Um, but I'm just saying that's the aspiration point. I, I want to clarify something. Um, 
because I feel like this happens a lot in conversations with, I'll say with myself uh, in particular, I didn't, it wasn't just the trauma that made it, that helped me, that made it so I left. That's, how, that's what helped me realize that I didn't need to be there. And from that, I said, well, what else is out there? What should I learn? What should I study? The way I actually became an atheist wasn't just that experience I had with the First Lady. It was also I read the Bible from cover to cover because I was so confused when I saw the Christians who were partying and things like that. And I said, wait, you can do that stuff? Okay, let me go read the Bible. And I read the Bible and I realized half of it didn't make sense, half of it wasn't consistent. And I started doing research, I started doing theological researches and things like where'd the Bible come from? Who decided what was the quote unquote word of God? Which by the way, no, 